we know that polyunsaturated fats like omega-3 fatty acids can actually help reduce symptoms and severity of cancer and also increase appetite. So that's going to be really super important to our dogs that are working on maintaining muscle mass and keeping them as healthy as we can. Welcome to Dog Cancer Answers, where we help you help your dog with cancer. Hello, friend. My name is Molly Jacobson, and today on Dog Cancer Answers, we are going to talk about a unique protein for your dog, venison. That's right, deer meat isn't just for hunters and their families. Your dog can enjoy it too, as a treat or a part of their regular diet. Our guest today is veterinarian Dr. Alex Ubell, who wrote a fascinating article on venison for our website, dogcancer.com. Let's talk about venison. All right. All right. So I know personally, venison is delicious. It's deer meat in essence. To me, it's something that my uncle used to bring (laughs) during hunting season. And we would put it in the freezer and then eat it all winter long. And it was delicious. So what is venison to you? So venison is defined as meat from a different game animals, antlered game animals. So mostly we think of it as deer. And most venison in the U.S. is going to be from white-tailed deer. Mm -hmm. But other animals that are still considered venison would be things like elk, reindeer, And then some other deer species that we see in the U.S., not as common as the white-tailed deer. We see red deer, mule deer, sika deer, fallow, and mount jack. Personally, not really where I am, but I think there are some uh, some mount jack in Texas. So I think a lot of deer species we've brought in, you know, from other countries, you know, Asia, and raised here. So those are not as common as the white-tailed. So is most venison that's commercially available in the U.S., is it commercial or is it like when people are eating venison, are they doing what I was doing when I was a kid and eating it because it came from the woods nearby or are most people buying it? Well, these days, because, you know, novel protein sources and proteins aside from our kind of standard, you know, beef, poultry and pork, I think venison has kind of increased in popularity. So the amount of venison is probably greatest coming from deer farms. And so that's going to be available. Um, It can be available at your grocery store, butcher shop. Sometimes the farms will directly sell it, I believe. Mm. But there's certainly a large population in the U.S. that does get their venison through hunting. It's an incredibly sustainable way to get meat. And um, yeah, and that's also good for the the local environment as well. Okay. So it's good for the humans? Is it good for the dogs? It is absolutely good for the dogs. So for healthy dogs, it's a great source of of protein. It's not going to be that different health-wise for them compared to beef, but the benefits of venison, mainly that it's much higher in protein and lower in fat, than beef Mm. can actually be very beneficial for some dogs with health conditions, especially those who are overweight or even dogs with cancer. Okay. All right. So this is something we can feed our dogs with cancer. Absolutely. And that it actually may be a better option than beef in some situations because we know that dogs with cancer do have an increased protein need. Venison typically has around 20-25% protein, which is higher than most other sources, most other meat sources. And has a great kind of selection of vitamins and minerals that are going to be good. Um, It has more copper and iron than beef. And then also is a great source of vitamins like potassium, phosphorus, zinc, and then a whole bunch of trace elements like chromium, molybdenum, mm. manganese, selenium. Oh, wow. It's a whole, whole range of really wonderful vitamins and minerals, also vitamin K and B12. And one of the things that actually makes it really ideal for dogs with cancer is that it has a higher concentration or higher amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids than beef. Actually contains three times more polyunsaturated fat than beef. And we know that polyunsaturated fats like omega-3 fatty acids can actually help 
reduce symptoms and severity of cancer and also increase appetite. So that's going to be really super important to our dogs that are working on maintaining muscle mass and keeping them as healthy as we can. That makes sense because they're generally eating grasses, right? And grass-fed, pasture-fed animals in general are getting more omega-3 fatty acids in their diet. So they pass that on to us. Am I right about that? In a way, yeah. So with venison, there is a difference between whether or not it's kind of a naturally grazing animal or if it's fed concentrate. Ah. So for deer that are farm raised, they're more likely going to be raised off concentrate. And so they're going to have a slightly higher fat concentration, okay. the muscle meat, than grazed animals. So if you know the deer that you get through hunting is probably going to have a lower you know, fat content than one that was from a farm raised on concentrate feed. Okay. But it will still be those good polyunsaturated fats that provide that anti-cancer benefit. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. What other dogs might benefit? Overweight. Overweight dogs. Okay. Overweight. Yep. So because it's got a nice high level of protein with low fat and lower calories, ah. it's a really great source. I think personally, it's an underutilized source of protein for dogs. You know, just like obesity is an issue with people, it's also a big issue with our pets. And so, you know, if there's a way to kind of meet that protein need, but kind of dial down the amount of fat, you know, and carbohydrates that they're eating, you can get to a healthier weight a little faster. Now, that being said, if you're doing like a home cooked diet and you're giving venison, because it's so low fat, it's really important to make sure that you are giving a fat source ah. in addition to the venison, because venison is definitely a meat where you need to um, really kind of balance things out in the diet because, you know, it can be easy with venison, if that's kind of the, the crux of your diet, to not add enough fats in. That's good information. That's where, you know, we always remind people that diet is just not a straightforward thing, right? Everything you add or take away unbalances or rebalances, and you want to make sure that you're not overdoing anything. Exactly. So venison, we want to make sure that we're getting enough fat in the diet and additional support. Mm -hmm. And, you know, definitely if you're doing an, you know, home cooked diet, consult sites like Balance It. That's a great, they've kind of revamped it recently. So it's a little different than it was, but still kind of has the kind of same features of, you know, you can put in your protein source and what you're putting in the diet and it'll help determine what you need to do to get it balanced. But I also definitely recommend people contact a veterinary nutritionist. Sure. You know, if they want to switch up their dog's protein source, that's a great thing to do, but, you know, reach out to someone who has that expertise so you can make sure you keep your dog as healthy as possible. That sounds good. Are there any dogs who should not eat venison? Most dogs tolerate venison very well. So it's not that there's, you know, it's going to be bad with venison. You know, it previously was kind of known as this, you know, novel protein source for dogs with allergies, but we now know that it can cross react. It can still have some issues with dogs that are allergic to beef. Ah. So if you have a dog that is allergic to beef, venison may not be a good protein source. Okay. Because they may still have allergic symptoms with that protein source. So that would be a situation where, you know, I'd caution against venison to try to find something, you know, a little bit different, you know, something like kangaroo or some, some of those <laughs> other proteins that are, you know, a little bit more diverged, you know, from the, from the beef and, and venison. Okay. Kangaroo, that would be an interesting protein to investigate for sure. Kangaroo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my understanding is that we need to be careful about parasites and other things in meat that is hunted. Mm -hmm. Is the commercial meat a little bit safer in terms of those things? What are the things to worry about with venison? Yeah. So in terms of like microbial contamination, it's definitely an issue if you're, if you're hunting and, and getting it yourself, but it's also an issue for farmed venison as well. 
the main bacteria that we're concerned about are, you know, your kind of your mainstays of Salmonella and E. coli. You know, those are still pose an issue here, like they do with other types of meat. Brucella, like brucellosis, also protozoans like toxoplasmosis, or parasites like trichinella. So those can all be present in venison. I would never recommend feeding venison raw especially not for dogs with cancer because they're likely going to have reduced strength in their immune systems and so they're going to be less able to fight off any microbes that you know might be hiding in the meat there other things that can be an issue with venison things like nitrosamines which are toxic and potentially cancer causing substances that can be created through a number of different means but primarily come about through pollution and fertilizers in areas nearby to where animals are grazing. So it's more likely to be in the meat in areas, if you're hunting in areas that maybe have some kind of local pollution issues. And that goes also for the toxic metals. So we do tend to see Uh more toxic and heavy metals in game meat. So those would be metals like cadmium, lead, mercury, and arsenic. So unfortunately, we can see those more in game meats. So would those be more present, you think, in meat that is hunted or farmed? Or does it matter? Is it in both? I think deer that come from different sources are going to be a little bit different in their makeup, right? Sure. So depending on, you know, what is the habitat of that particular deer that you've hunted versus what is the environment of the farm in terms of, you know, what are they feeding and where is it located and mm-hmm. all those kind of things can vary. Okay. But generally game meat is, is known to be a little bit higher in those um, toxic metals. And that also can be affected by how they're hunted. So it's really important not to use, you know, bullets or shot that has any lead in it. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, make sure that you, you know, try to reduce the amount of heavy metals as much as possible if you are hunting. Right. It's funny to think of hunting as being a progressive cause, but in some ways it really is that evolution of de-leading bullets so that we don't contaminate meat with heavy metals is really... Interesting turn of events. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, hunting gets, you know, it certainly gets a a bad rap in some, you know, some areas of the country, but certainly for deer can have a lot of very positive impact, you know, on the local ecology. And I will go right to that, but I did want to make sure I didn't neglect chronic wasting disease. Oh, yeah. Because that is something that we do see, unfortunately, quite a bit in deer. So not likely in a hopefully not in a farmed and farmed deer but certainly present in the wild Um, so if you are hunting you want to make sure not to hunt animals that look a little off that are maybe thin unkempt are they drooling you know appearing listless so those are some of the symptoms of chronic wasting it's a hundred percent fatal and is a prion disease oh. um, it's also not killed through heat or cooking oh yep so is it a it bacteria is, I, is it a it's a prion so a prion is essentially a misfolded protein that's almost infectious to other proteins in terms of like it kind of gets them to fold incorrectly as well and so it can so it's a really it's a really interesting you know because you can't even really call it a microbe but it's a really interesting kind of disease process mad cow disease is another example of a prion okay so yeah that would be bad if you it's not killed by because it's a problem in the protein itself it's not killed correct it's the protein folding you know and it's something that you know likely doesn't pose a serious risk to human health, although I would strongly recommend against eating any deer that you have any concern of being affected by chronic wasting disease. And I would also recommend getting your deer tested, getting that tested so that you know it's safe to consume. You know, have there been reports of illness in a person directly tied to chronic wasting? I don't believe so. 
That being said, I would strongly caution against. Yeah, why <laughs> um, chance it? You know, exactly. We know that you know mad cow can potentially you know lead to Creutzfeldt Jakob, which is kind of related to protein misfolding. So try mm. to avoid that if at all possible. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So no chronic wasting disease deer. And the way if you're hunting is you just if the deer looks sick. Yeah. Don't. don't don't eat it. Don't eat it. <laughs> Don't eat it. Yes. And get your deer tested for chronic wasting before consuming because they don't all obviously sick. You know, they can be at different stages. So it's, it's still a good idea to get them tested. Yeah. Okay. That sounds really helpful. And then you mentioned that heat doesn't destroy chronic wasting disease. Correct. Let's take a short break here. And then when we come back, I want you to talk about how to cook venison. If someone's dog has cancer, you'd think the last thing that they'd want to hear about three times a week in their inbox is more about cancer. So why do tens of thousands of folks subscribe to Dog Cancer News? Well, because our editors bring you the latest information on the complex world of dog cancer. And that includes all aspects like diet tips and recipes and lifestyle advice and just plain hope and a little bit of joy. Treating dog cancer is hard enough as it is. Dog Cancer News is there to support you and bring you warmth. Go to dogcancernews.com to sign up for free and start getting dog cancer news delivered to your inbox. And we're back with Dr. Alex Ubell. So how do you recommend venison be prepared? Well, as long as you're, you've, tested the deer and they test negative for chronic wasting, then you don't really have to be concerned in terms of that issue. Okay. In terms of preparing it, you should really cook venison, especially if it's ground meat, Mm -hmm. to 160, 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. You know, for ground, it's going to be on that higher end. If it's something like venison steaks, it's going to be, you know, you can go with, you know, 160 because it's not as much that risk of contamination as there is with ground meat. So if you get to 165, you're going to be killing off harmful bacteria and the meat will be safe to consume at that time. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. So that's across the board, farm raised, hunted, get it to 160 if it's a steak and 165 if it's ground. If it's ground. Yeah. And with, with venison, because it has such a high iron content, you know, you can't really gauge doneness in a venison steak the way you can with beef. So definitely use a thermometer. That's, you know, that's going to be your best bet to know really where you are in the cooking process. All right. That sounds really good. There's a company here on Maui that hunts venison and then makes delicious venison strips Ooh. and they sell them as dog treats on the mainland. Like jerky? Yeah, venison jerky. And I can't remember the name of the brand. We can put a link in the show notes, but dogs go mad for them. (laughs) I love venison jerky. I I bet they do. I would go go mad for them. (laughs) Yes. I know the gentleman who owns the company and it's a good thing. We need to keep our deer population really controlled because we're an island Mm -hmm. and it's the best way. It's making dogs happy. It's a little bit of Maui. (laughs) in deer strips. That's what's so great about, you know, deer and as a, you know, sustainable food source is there's so many areas of the country that are being just kind of overrun with deer, mostly white-tailed deer. And in some areas of the country, it gets to where there's, you know, hit by car problems because, you know, and they're causing problems in the local wildlife, the plant matter that they're eating and, you know, they're kind of disrupt local ecology. So, Typically, the number of hunting licenses that are provided every year by various fish and wildlife agencies are typically determined by, you know, what is their deer population and how many, you know, how many licenses are they going to give out to, you know, try to scale that population to a healthy place. So in that way, I think hunting's a really, a really great thing to do to kind of augment, you know, your, your family's protein intake. Absolutely. And as long as you are being cognizant of the potential, you know, choosing the right bullets and not eating meat that has chronic wasting disease, then it's safe. (laughs) Absolutely. Frankly, it's truly a delicious food. 
It is. And I, I did want to throw in there, if you are a hunter out there listening, um, some important things to remember when you're handling deer after, you know, after hunting, you want to make sure that you always wear gloves when you're dressing the meat, just in case there's a chronic wasting issue, try to avoid handling the brain and spinal cord. And if you're hunting in temperatures over 40 degrees Fahrenheit, you should make sure to chill that meat within three to four hours. Mm. If you don't, bacterial growth and contamination will become a more serious issue. So you really need to get that meat cooled down as soon as possible. Great tips. Do you have anything else to share with us about venison today? Let's see. What else do we want to share? In terms of just kind of an example of what we can see with venison, and this is direct from the USDA, with three and a half ounces of ground venison, you can expect that it will have around 160 calories, 22 grams of protein, and then around seven grams of fat. Now, the amount of fat that you can see in venison really does vary as we discussed. It can vary because of food, can vary because of species. It can also vary on what part of the deer you're eating. So typically it's in the single digits though. It can be from 3% to 8 or 9%. Wonderful. It sounds like a really good option for a lot of people to try with their dogs. How do you recommend people start feeding their dogs venison if they want to try this perhaps novel protein? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I always uh, like to recommend, you know, start, start small, you know, see if your dog likes venison, <laughs> you know, start <laughs> off just, you know, before deciding, you know, making kind of the unilateral decision to, to put your dog over to a new protein source, make sure that they like it. Yeah. Um, you know, a, a diet isn't going to do your dog any good if they don't eat it. So I recommend, you know, starting as a little snack, you know, maybe one ounce bit of, you know, meat that you kind of cook up, give us a little treat or, you know, like a little training treat or things like that. See if your dog does well with it. And, you know, if they enjoy it and you have a good access to venison and want to make that a more regular part of their diet, I absolutely think that's a great idea. Just make sure that you check in with your with your vet or nutritionist or balancing software so you can make sure that you're, again, not kind of throwing things out of balance in terms of the fat content, especially of your dog's diet. Right. Well, thank you, Dr. Ubel, for joining us today and talking to us about venison. We so appreciate your expertise and insights. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been great speaking with you today. And thank you, friend, for listening. Locally hunted venison is a great sustainable meat choice for your dog. All venison is a healthy protein source for our dogs with cancer. You might consider adding venison to your dog's diet if she needs some extra protein and healthy fats, or if you're looking to lose some weight, or if she just wants to try something different. Check out the show notes for links mentioned in today's show, and don't forget to follow us in your favorite podcast app. As always, you can always access all of our past episodes and many more dog cancer resources on our website at dogcancer.com. I'm Molly Jacobson. From all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'd like to wish you and your dog a very warm aloha. Thank you for listening to Dog Cancer Answers. If you'd like to connect, please visit our website at dogcancer.com or call our listener line at 808-868-3200. And here's a friendly reminder that you probably already know. This podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to take the place of the advice you receive from your dog's veterinarian. Only veterinarians who examine your dog can give you veterinary advice or diagnose your dog's medical condition. Your reliance on the information you hear on this podcast is solely at your own risk. If your dog has a specific health problem, contact your veterinarian. Also, please keep in mind that veterinary information can change rapidly. Therefore, some information may be out of date. Dog Cancer Answers is a presentation of Maui Media in association with Dog Podcast Network.